Good afternoon, everyone who's everywhere but the East Coast, and good morning to those who are still in the West. It is great to have you joining our first Upswell pop-up. My name is Dan Cardinale, and I am President and CEO of Independent Sector, who hosts Upswell. An independent sector is a national membership organization uh, made up of nonprofits and foundations and corporate giving programs. And um, we have, over the last few years, really brought the Upswell community together, really on behalf of the sector. And um, what is Upswell, for those of you who are new, um, and for those of you who are joining us, a welcome back. As you all know, that we hold a very kind of simple belief um, in the Upswell community, and that is that every person can thrive and should thrive, especially those of us living in the United States. What we mean by thrive is that each person um, gets to unleash their full humanity, and we do that individually and collectively. And it is, in fact, this belief that all people can and should thrive that drives our community. Um, and it is what makes up the Upswell community. And so as a community, we're kind of a, a, a diverse and somewhat restless group of change makers that come from the nonprofit sector who are professionals and volunteers, organizational leaders and staff. Some are philanthropists and innovators and artists. Other are corporate citizens and leaders in the business community. We have wonderful community activists and extraordinary social entrepreneurs and basically anybody that's dedicated to kind of collective thriving. And it is this notion that everyone can thrive um, that we then are committed to a healthy and racially equitable nation. We can't have a nation that is healthy and thriving without racial equity. So fighting for racial justice and getting the nation uh, as healthy as we possibly can is really what drives us. And um, it is only through the collective effort, um, and that's why we have Upswell designed the way we do, that we think that we can kind of lean into this innovative work of racial justice uh, that unleashes the health of the nation. So over the course of this upcoming year until the end of 2021, we will have uh, three more um, Upswell pop-up events. And then in October, we'll have the big summit where we take all this collective learning over the four pop-ups and bring them into a three-day kind of uh, massive event where we learn and catalyze and unleash the uh, opportunity for us to kind of drive forward in uh, rebuilding our nation. One thing I will say uh, for those of you who are new to Upswell <clears throat> and for those of you who are returning, I wanna thank you because we are tireless in asking you for your feedback after each of these events. And many of you really take us seriously that we believe in kind of the building of this community. And so this year we've added an additional element to Upswell, which we'll tell you a little bit more about at the end called the Upswell Exchanges but they're a terrific opportunity for us to really uh, deepen and catalyze our work. So let's turn to the task at hand, uh, today's pop-up. Um, and I'd like to challenge us, we ask a kind of fundamental question in this pop-up. And it's a simple but powerful one. And that is, uh, we've seen in 2020 and now into 2021, that uh, the world has collided into a set of disruptions that has broken open possibilities and put in very high relief, both the extraordinary structures that hold uh, communities of color and disenfranchised communities back, as well as increased opportunities for us to rebuild and remake those structures. Today's pop-up wrestles with the question of, are we going to step into that adaptive reconstructive work or are we gonna retreat back and get comfortable into systems that we know what they do for communities of colors and poor communities across the United States? So that's the task at hand. Um, and we hope through today's uh, conversation that we can confront the fact that we have to acknowledge and repair the deepest wounds that we have before us. And there is extraordinary opportunity to drive that work forward. And so the question we ask is, what is the relationship between trust and racial equity in this rebuilding effort? And we have an extraordinary lineup of folks, and I'm just delighted that you all can join us. 
couple of housekeeping items as you're going through the next couple of hours. Uh, the lines are muted, but we do absolutely want your engagement. And there are two fundamental ways you can do that. The first is when you have a question, we ask you to use the Q&A box. Um, most of you are now Zoom pros. Um, but we also want, if you have comments or thoughts or insights you want to share with the group, we ask you to pop those in the chat box so that we can have collective engagement and learning. We actually pay very close attention to the chat so we can learn about the comments and what's moving people and what the questions are. Um, and at the end, as I mentioned, we do really, really pay attention to the survey. So we ask that you um, uh, fill out uh, the, the survey and give us your best thinking, what worked, what didn't, and we take that to heart. And then know that this will be mailed out to you um, this uh, full two hours. Um, it will also be on the upswell.org website where you can get it on the on-demand section. So we try and make all of this kind of a public good. <clears throat> So with all that, I want to just take a moment and uh, stop and just acknowledge I live in Washington, D.C., and our offices at Independent Sector are based in Washington, D.C., which is the ancestral home of the Neskotchtan, Anacostan, and the Piscataway people who continue to live in this area and work to reclaim their land and traditional practices. I also want to acknowledge that a number of the buildings and places we inhabit here in Washington were built with labor of enslaved people. In addition, while we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's important that we pause to remember the more than 550,000 people who've lost their lives to COVID-19 just in the US, as well as the countless others who have suffered and continue to suffer at the hands of injustice in our communities. So we're gonna take a moment of silence to remember all of those folks. Thank you. And once again, I want to welcome you all and tell you how just thrilled we are that you are uh, joining us. And with that, I want to introduce our moderator, Kis Christina Guergi, who, by the way, is celebrating her birthday tomorrow. So please join me in wishing her a happy birthday, Christina. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm super excited for this first conversation with you all. Um, as we get our panelists up and uh, I'll introduce them, um, also would love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat. Go ahead and um, drop your name, uh, organization, and maybe where you're joining us from. I'm joining you from Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, and with that, I will start introducing our panelists. So we have first um, Dr. Utebi Essien. He is the Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and a health equity research expert. Dr. Essien has applied his disparities research framework to COVID-19 um, to examine the disproportionate toll that COVID-19 is taking on communities of color in the United States. We also have with, with us a uh, fan of independent sector and Upswell been with us before, Dr. Ram, Rami Nashashibi, the founder and executive director of the nonprofit organization, Inner City Muslim Action Network. Iman Foster's health, wellness, and, and healing um, on Chicago's South Side and Atlanta's West End by organizing for social change, cultivating the arts, and operating a holistic health center. As a community leader, building bridges across racial, religious, and socioeconomic divides, he works to confront the challenges of poverty and disinvestment in urban communities. Rami is also a 2017 MacArthur Genius Fellow. So thank you both for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So before we get into the questions, just to give folks background, I'm sure, um, and if you're here, you know this, but uh, communities of color have been hit disproportionately hard by coronavirus. We are at a higher risk of infection and death from COVID-19 due to discrimination, health access and utilization, occupation, education, income, and wealth gaps, and housing inequities. We also wanna be mindful that there's been a lot written about vaccine hesitancy from black, native, and other communities of color because of the history of racism from our health and medical community. But there's also an issue of vaccine access. 
and malicious misinformation campaigns being target, targeted toward marginalized communities. So all those factors are what um, cause this distrust in the vaccine, distrust in the health community, um, and in other institutions like any nonprofit working with people every day. And that's the focus of our discussion. Um, how do we turn the curve and do better um, for our future? And how do we get to our communities a healthier and more equitable space? So with that, we'll start the discussion. Dr. Essien, I'd love to have you go first and um, share with us a little bit about your research and the data you have collected about COVID-19 and um, how it, it affects different communities differently. Sure. So thanks again so much for the opportunity to share with you all today. Happy early birthday, Christina. Um, <laughs> and really honored to, to share the virtual stage with, with Rami. I'm really excited for our conversation uh, and to learn from everyone else today. Um, so like, as you mentioned, Christina, so beautifully, there's just so uh, many factors that have gone into the disproportionate toll that um, COVID-19 has taken on communities of color and to be specific, African-American or black communities, Hispanic or Latinx, uh, Native American, American Indian, Alaska Native communities, and even some uh, Asian American communities, depending on location and where we've been looking. And so we've really seen uh, higher rates of infection, higher rates of death, uh, higher rates of hospitalization across the board. And as we're now at the, um, the other side of the pandemic a year later and starting to finally have the opportunity to vaccinate individuals, we're seeing really lower rates of, uh, of vaccination across some of these racial and ethnic groups as we'll, we'll be talking about. And really a lot of what we've seen from the data as we look back all the way to March was as we looked across the country or across the ocean rather and saw the data come out of Italy and from uh, from China and suggesting that folks with high rates of chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity were really the risk factors associated with bad infection from COVID. We started to worry those of us in the health equity space that, well, those are the same conditions that are more common in communities of color. Those are the same conditions that we're seeing fill up our, our clinics and our hospitals um, around cities and urban environments, rural environments around the country. And that's why many of us were worried and not surprised, honestly, when the, the information came out of New York City, of New Orleans, of St. Louis, that um, Black and Hispanic individuals were dying at higher rates. And all over the pandemic, we were start, all over the timeline, rather, we started to see those numbers play out across the country. And so we worried about those chronic risk factors. The fact that those chronic risk factors exist aren't because black and brown bodies are different from um, our white counterparts. I think it's important to emphasize that there haven't been any biological uh, findings to drive these disparities. And it's really been connecting to the social factors. And um, those social drivers include in access to insurance. We're gonna be talking about access a lot today. They include abilities to work from home that you know we talked about with our speakers that many of us have spent the last year curating our Zoom backgrounds while our colleagues, neighbors have been going out to work every single day, hopping on public transportation, um, residing in neighborhoods that have higher rates of pollution that ultimately uh, raise high rates of infection. And so I think a lot of those are the big reason why we're seeing the, the huge disparities in, in COVID-19 infection and death. And so again, I know we're gonna touch on a lot of this and so I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Rami, for you, uh, your organization uh, runs a whole model for health in your communities. And so uh, to some extent, I'm very curious about how you know, prepared you were for this pandemic. What about the pandemic surprised you when you're uh, working in the communities or, or what was somewhat predictable based on what you know? Well, first, let me start off by, again, thanking Dan and all of the organizers at Upswell and also Christina, wishing you and all of the great Aries babies, of which I am Thank one, you. all of great. the uh, it's a great month for a great uh, sign. Um, so, and, and Dr. Asian, great to be on a panel with you. I would just start to uh, first by echoing, I think, the most unsurprising 
facet of what Dr. Asian mentioned, which is uh, what he just ended with, which is there's absolutely no biological explanation for the disparity. And that is not a surprise. Um, and the sociological literature going back decades continue to tell us the exact same thing. A colleague at the University of Chicago, I say colleague, he was coming in, he was going out as I was coming in in that department, but a well-known text by Eric Klenenberg back in early 2000 talked about the heat wave. Some of you remember a heat wave of social autopsy of disaster in Chicago. Almost 16 years later, there was a great documentary done on that text called Cook, Survival by Zip Code. And it, and, and it essentially lays out everything that was unfolded. And that, again, was the least surprising thing. It's the all the other social variables of who lives where, who has access, access to transportation, the variables of extreme poverty in neighborhoods and all of the other circumstances that in moments of a quote unquote natural disaster continue to lead to a disproportionate amounts of death in black and brown communities in urban centers like Chicago, New Orleans and across the country. And so that part of it was the least surprising. I think the most um, pleasantly surprising, uh, and although those of us who kind of have a spiritual aspirational hope that that would lead to a kind of a reckoning of sorts, I think it was nobody knew back in February or March that this uh, disaster, that this pandemic would be compounded by the pandemic of racial uh, uh, um, you know, the violence that ensued because of police violence and because of the reckoning around racial injustice. And I think it was the compounding of these two pandemics that led to an opening of a kind of uh, ability to have conversations about deep systems change that I think some of us were pleasantly surprised to see happening in the private sector, public sector, uh, in faith communities, in, uh, in the nonprofit sector, among major philanthropic entities, I think beginning to think about more deep-seated radical interventions that get at deep-seated changes. And so that community groups like ours didn't just have to speak to uh, meeting people at the disaster level, which is where we are often pivoted to respond. And uh, that can be a very exhausting. I mean, we mobilized 60,000 pounds of food. We were, we run a federally qualified health center. So we were from day one, kept our doors open, trying to pivot to meeting people who are coming home from jails, people who are, you know, in the neighborhoods while still trying to make sure and fight for a seat at the table to make sure that our voices were also included in the long-term system change conversation, which we have been advocating and pushing for for many, for many years. And so that adjustment was a critical one for us to be able to continue to make, i.e. meet the needs of the community while make sure that we were, our voices were also being heard in those larger conversations about policy and deep systems change when it came at a much you know, larger macro level. Great, and so as we are entering sort of the beginning of the end, right? We're at the precipice of hopefully turning a corner on COVID-19. Um, we're seeing the reality of vaccine rollout play out in front of our eyes. What role do each of you see um, that that trust plays in that? Um, and I'll you know start with you, Dr. Yesian, and then um, and then Rami. Yeah. So again, it's the um, subject of our conversation. So of course we're going to focus in on trust and. The way that I've been thinking about it over the last several months is that rather than focusing specifically on trust is thinking about trustworthiness. And as a physician, that is um, a, a question that I ask myself, ask my colleagues every day is how um, trustworthy are we as healthcare providers to our patients and to our communities? Um, 
the fact of the matter is that there is a long, dangerous legacy and history of uh, racism and racial bias in our healthcare system. And so the fact that certain communities may not trust or be excited to get this new medication or new preventive therapy rather um, shot into their arms is reasonable because of that legacy and, um, and history. And it's a legacy that extends beyond the US public health syphilis study uh, in Tuskegee, Alabama that so many are familiar with to um, the story of James Marion Sims, one of the, the father of gynecology, quote unquote, who operated on um, dozens of black women without consent and without anesthesia to become a leader in the field of gynecology. Tools are still being used today, um, named after him. It extends to the radiation experiments that took place in um, largely predominantly black uh, male inmates in prisons around the country, including right here in Pennsylvania where I'm located. And so and then it extends to over the past few years where we've seen uh, study after study come out suggesting that black individuals, for example, who show up in the hospital with pain are less likely to be treated with that pain. And so we have that history and legacy, but we also have what's happening today and, and the everyday experiences of our community members. And so it really does, again, push back against uh, trust being the main issue as opposed to trustworthiness. Um, and as you mentioned, Christina, as, as well, that we need to think about access and, and, and how, if we are offering um, a, a new therapy to our communities saying, hey, this is gonna help us get over to the other side of the pandemic, what does that availability of the therapy look like? You know, what are the, where are the pharmacies that are getting them located? My colleagues and I wrote a study just looking at geographic access. How likely are you to live within 10 miles of uh, a potential vaccine a delivery site and found that individuals of, um, of color, specifically black individuals were more, far more likely to live more than 10 miles away compared to their white counterparts. And, you know, folks might say 10 miles, that's a 10 to 15 minute drive on um, in the car, but we also know that car ownership is less in, in black communities. We know uh, so many challenges structurally, um, systematically that exist to really be a hindrance here. And so, uh, continuing to think about trust and trustworthiness, but also addressing some of these structural factors around access is really going to be critical here. Yeah, I, I would just, you know, build on that, Dr. Essien, and as you were kind of listing out all this, all the many reasons beyond Tuskegee, right, to acknowledge, and this is not just perfunctory, um, you know, prefaces to conversations. And I think this is critical for people to understand. This has a direct impact on abilities to kind of begin to uh, deal with the extraordinary, profoundly painful trust gap that does exist in our communities. We've given now over a thousand vaccines. We just, you know, um, here on the South side of Chicago, uh, probably a third or fourth of black communities, the Latinx, then immigrant and other communities are uh, being that last kind of third or so. And, you know, it, you know, you add to the studies things like even, you know, and this was captured in an extraordinary book a couple of years ago by the journalist Adam Cohen, Imbecels, the Supreme Court, American Eugenics and the Sterilization of Kerry Buck that case that led to over 70,000 sterilizations of predominantly black, brown, and even white poor women uh, across the country and, under, and undergirded by a very white supremacist logic that infiltrated science. Uh, so acknowledging the racial scientific basis beyond Tuskegee and to be able to be honest about that with our communities, I've seen just the acknowledgement of that. I've seen doctors come into rooms, uh, physicians, where there's a, a heated conversation of folks of color, black and brown, in other words, and just having a doctor acknowledge that and then not try to offer any other explanation beyond the acknowledgement, then opens up a very genuine conversation. Well, doc, what do you think? Pfizer and Moderna, at the end of that conversation, Right, I've seen the start of the conversation saying there's absolutely no way we're getting these vaccines. And then having a physician come in the room, not try to sell the vaccine 
but to first start with a very honest conversation to say that there should there is no way any uh, any person could look at an African American uh, in this country and and that and blame them for healthy skepticism towards the uh, health industrial complex in this country and its intersecting relationship with white supremacy and other kind of social disparities. That's an important piece. So having that conversation is critical. We found that. Moving forward, um, you know, we have set out an entire conversation, an entire pedagogy around grassroots education when it comes to the vaccine, when it comes to faith, when it comes to racial disparity that we are unfolding as we're going into our communities. Our biggest push though, Christina, and is I think what something Dan alluded to earlier. At the end of the day, let us not um, obscure what we are all doing um, and are, are, are in some way sublimated. We are still peddling for Moderna, Pfizer, and now J&J. &J. Okay, so the critique that we are not out here pushing big pharma, uh, we just have to accept that. We are pushing big pharma and we are pushing big pharma into the arms of millions. And that's a critique that we need to absorb because the, co the conversation is, well, what after that, right? What are we doing to pump the same billions of dollars into the social economic infrastructure that has created these disparities for decades beyond kind of just the vaccination. Um, and while that vaccination, I am vaccinated and vaccinated and pushing the vaccine as well because we care for the health of our loved ones, we do need to take the critique and take it honestly about what are we prepared to do to make the type of Marshall Plan investment visions to begin to you know, uh, right the wrongs of the socioeconomic racial disparities that have led to the type of disaster that we see unfolding in this moment. I mean, that's, I'm, it's a phenomenal point. Um, I think one of the other things that you have, Rami, some specific uh, potentially ex examples and experience with, right, is how do you um, do that acknowledgement and also share information where meets people where they are in, in this moment? Could you talk a little bit, because we have folks in our audience from all over the country, do you have, do you have experience in the examples of how things have differed in Chicago versus Atlanta, or how you've had to approach certain communities differently than others, um, to, again, to meet folks where they are around the issue of vaccinations? Yeah, I mean, Dr. Essien spoke to it, you know, oftentimes trust and trustworthiness is a great, I think, nuanced distinction. Who are the trustworthy agents, right, to carry the information? Um, uh, where does faith play a role? I mean, I've had really some of the most beautiful breakthrough conversations at five o'clock in the morning, sitting around a large prayer circle outside physically distance to be able to talk about the intersecting role of faith and medicine and belief and, and, and be able to have that very honest conversation with people's fears. In Chicago, I think um, we are still more fortunate in the sense that in the state of Illinois, um, the alignment at the federal, at the kind of state level, city, county, and nonprofit, and even private sector, I think is more harmonious than we have in places like Georgia and Atlanta, which of course, I think is not a surprise to anyone. Uh, we've had people, our staff in Georgia, banging on our door in Chicago to say, we're ready to travel. And these are black folks for the most part saying we're ready to travel to Chicago to get the vaccine because we can't wait any longer in Atlanta. And I think the painful irony that the heart place of the, you know, where the CDC is located is still there, you know, the, the myth that black folks are not aggressively looking for opportunities for vaccines is just that. Uh, and we've seen that bear out. I think now there are things that are trying to remedy that in Atlanta and people are beginning to really invest the significant amounts of infrast you know, resources and private dollars to do that. And we're part of those efforts in places like Atlanta. But I think in Chicago, we have seen the, the value of taking the time 
we were at one point about to apply for large mass vaccination uh, RFPs with the city. And we, I think wise, you know, with, with great wisdom and deliberation pulled back from that because we realized that our community was not ready for that type, that we needed to do a lot more grassroots community education to prepare our community for that. And that we needed to kind of spend more time on the ground with trustworthy agents who themselves have been vaccinated to talk about those other conversations that we've been having. And so using art uh, as, a, as a mechanism, I'll talk about that later, using kind of the community organizing component as a mechanism, using faith-based networks as a mechanism in Chicago has proven to be really important. Great, and so Dr. Essien, from your perspective on the medical side, I mean, I, I'd love to hear sort of your reaction to what Rami is saying about the acknowledgement and um, how that helps to establish trust and you know the grassroots information. How does that play into how you on the medical side or on the research side do your work and what could you do moving forward differently? Yeah, no, I think it's such an important question. And again, I love um, Rami highlighting again specific points and examples that we we all should be thinking about. How can we actually incorporate those into our, our everyday lives? Um, my colleague has used a phrase, the phrase vaccine deliberation. Like these aren't just a one-off decision. Yes, I'm going to take it. Where do I go? But folks need time. <laughs> my dad still needs time to make this decision despite um, him also knowing the science behind it um, and it feeling like it's been so long. What's taken them so long? It's like, no, some people just need a little bit more time. And when they have, but when they have come to that decision, please don't let them have to do another great migration from Georgia to Illinois to be able to actually get that vaccine, right? Um, so again, specifically to Rami's point, but I think we do have to do a better job as a health system to to both listen, learn, and lead. I think those are my my three L's that I keep trying to um, to emphasize, especially around this point. And listening is talking to our patients, listening to community members, asking them what their needs are. Another colleague suggests um, ask, um, kind of promoting the idea that Black wise matter. And again, as a Black man, that's the group that I get to interact with the most. Of course, there are other so many other groups that have been really having a tough time with access, but asking individuals, hey, is it because of your lack of insurance that you're worried what's going to happen to me if, you know, for some reason I'm the 0.005% of folks who have a bad reaction to this vaccine and I don't have insurance and I show up to the emergency department, I end up with this huge bill. That is a big reason that folks are concerned about, that some folks are concerned about getting vaccines. How can I actually get the time off? Everyone says that in 48 hours, your arm is sore, you're getting febrile and, and, and having chills. What will happen after I do that? How does that weigh into an individual's decision? And so really addressing those concerns and not just, again, uh, invoking the idea of a syphilis study that was funded by the United States that's the big driver for why folks aren't getting vaccinated. Um, and so that's the listen part. The learning part is huge. You know, I have all these books in, in the background to represent how much of non-science reading I've had an opportunity to do over the last few over the last year in particular. And I think it's because it is the historians, the lawyers, the public health um, leaders, the sociologists, um, folks who have moved outside of the scientific and biologic driver of health space into actually thinking about what the social drivers of health mean um, and what that history means, that long 400 plus year history um, of racism in our country, structural oppressive racism that is the reason we have a wealth gap, an education gap, a health Health gap in almost any city that we turn to. And without healthcare system leaders knowing that history, we're going to continue to search for the gene that must explain why black and brown bodies have more infection rates and publish these findings in huge medical, um, high impact medical journals, rather than actually thinking about the social drivers that W.E.B. Du Bois was talking about in, in the 1890s in the Philadelphia Negro. And so we have to, as healthcare system, learn. And lastly, lead. We uh, we can lead in these spaces. Uh, Rami is just sharing some of their experiences out in, in Chicago. And those are the stories that we need to hear about. Here, I'm a, also a, a 
VA provider, and we're actually seeing really different experiences with getting Black veterans vaccinated um, compared to what we're seeing in the civilian side of things. What can we actually learn from folks that are doing a great job um, doing that, and how can we use those examples to lead uh, across the country? And so I'm hopeful that we can start to kind of take some of those key steps along the way. Great, and people are sending in questions. Thank you so much, um, audience members who are doing that. Please continue to do that. I'll pull one actually now um, before I continue on with our, our sort of established questions, but um, in, both of you could answer this or, or one of you, but do you feel that better communication and public health initiatives educating the public should have been and should still be a large part of the rollout and execution of mass vaccination efforts? I think, you know, one of, one of my responses to that question goes back to the point that Dr. Essien was just making about this holistic social determinants of health dynamic. You know, we rarely, we have siloed our conversations so that public health is often sometimes siloed to a particular kind of stratosphere of conversations, sociological analysis and community analysis. And I, I think what I'm hoping and praying that this moment helps is to break down a lot of those barriers and allow us to honestly have that holistic conversation that Dr. Essien was alluding to. You know, um, ta Coates kicked open a big door in the Atlantic uh, when he pu pu published an article on reparations. Long before him, sociologists like Loic Wakant and others were honestly talking about slavery as a variable to connect to post-industrial ghettos to talk to Jim Crow and mass incarceration. Michelle Alexander publishes her text. We have now very serious conversations about reparations. They should not be siloed conversations. That is really in some very real ways still the crux of the matter. We have just to look at Chicago this last year, I mean, we're still dealing with the impact of mass incarceration, of going from a country in the 70s that had 300,000 people incarcerated to like now 2.3 million, the largest incarcerated population in the Western industrialized world. And the implications, even Republican governors across the country were scrambling in March and April of last year, acknowledging that their prisons were overcrowded by maybe 15 to 20,000. And what they started to do was in a knee jerk reaction, partner with anyone to get them out back into the communities. But what they had to confront in that moment is where do we send them? To the same four or five zip codes that people are coming back and recidivating at 50 plus percentage, where there's no holistic health, no holistic job, no holistic housing, even more immense, you know, uh, uh, kind of emaciated infrastructure that was when they first incarcerated, where extreme rates of poverty rose by 375% in Chicago from 2000 to 2016. And then we had the spike of violence in 2016. And everyone's wondering, well, you know, how do we reduce the spike? And we're not talking about those root causes. And so we, we are now on the eve of a massive mental health crisis that's about to be part of this other wave of the pandemic, coupled with this is still the effects of infrastructure and poverty and loss of jobs. So going to that question about public health, we need to start having these holistic conversations and being and, and begin to advance them more. And I think it's conversations like this that I that give me hope that we're having it, but it goes back to Dan's opening question. Do we have the political will, passion, fierce urgency of now and self-interest enough to sustain these conversations long enough to make the type of long-term impact? And part of that will be gauged by the type of discourse and tenure that our public health conversation looks like. Dr. Essien, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think I would just add again, when when health equity isn't cool, when racism and, and anti-racism um, aren't buzzwords that get you NIH um, funds to support grants that get you grants at the state or local level, what 
are things going to look like? Right now, everyone is looking for the next dark face to give a talk about racism and public health and health equity. But what happens next year? What happens in a couple of years? Um, what will the retribution look like? And again, we shouted out Dr. Um, Tanahasi Coates, who wrote about his piece and many others about what happened after eight years of the first Black president, perhaps a more liberal policy what our country, the decisions our country made and how things have shifted. Um, and so I, I think we're going to really see just how invested our, our health systems are in actually sustaining health equity. Um, I think a lot of what we're talking about here today is about the vaccine, uh, but we can't have vaccine blinders as another one of my colleagues puts it. We can't only look at health equity um, around how do we get shots in arms, but um, Rami mentioned this as well, that we have to look beyond the pandemic and beyond all those structural factors that are what resulted in us having really a disproportionate impact of this um, last year on the communities of color. So you both have, have touched this and I think it's really important for our audience that comes from organizations of all sorts of missions, right? They, we've got everybody in the audience does different parts of what you are all saying. Um, I, I think Rami, I'd love you to, to get a little deeper on, on why we need a collective effort around this and bring in some of your um, experience using arts, using faith-based based communities to drive this work and be in a very collective approach forward. If, if you could give a few examples of that or how others could, could start that if that's not something that's already happening in their community or in their organization. Yeah, among the things that we did, especially with the arts community and because arts is always an arts expression has always been a a big part of our work is immediately after, you know, we were making this case along with others that artists are frontline workers, um, that they are the ones, our graffiti writers, our public poets are the ones that are helping keeping the social fabric, the creative fabric of our communities together. Um, we very quickly tried to rework the term social distance into physical distance and started very quickly trying to insert very creatively that this time more than any is the time we need to push back on the notion of being socially distanced. Um, that it is in fact the social isolation, it is a social disconnection that in many create, you know, ways leads to further isolation, uh, behavior health issues, mental health issues, and lots of associated primary care issues. And so we think we use things like um, a combination of uh, things we did, we were calling the uh, internet cipher, uh, internet kind of cipher creative uh, ciphers, we were calling them, where we would uh, distribute, for instance, iPads to senior residents who couldn't get out. We did brought artists from our larger national artist network community, and we would facilitate on Zoom and other kind of forums, very intimate, uh, very intimate kind of ciphers that would use art as a way to think about behavior health, to think about some of the mental health issues as a forum to connect, as a forum to talk about what people were going through. We did public artistic uh, displays when we were able to do so, again, in a public physically distant uh, capacity. And when we were confronted uh, with the gruesome death of George Floyd and the subsequent wave of responses to that. Um, even personally as an artist, I collaborated with some of our artists and we produced the, the video that um, was kind of in the opening track and used that kind of framework to talk about the very brutal reality of the sustained police violence in our community and, and its links to poverty and its links to in, uh, kind of mental health stress and all the other variables that lead to kind of the disproportionate you know, issues that physiologically affected folks and just found that having artistic forums, whether it was public, whether it was a hybrid forums, created opportunities for people to sustain connectivity, helped artists in extraordinary times of need. We raised money to help support those artists when gigs were uh, shut off. And we did and used arts even in ways in which we thought about our public development projects, you know, in the heart of Inglewood as we kept building what we are hopefully uh, uh, opening, which is the first community led fresh market uh, that we hope to uh, uh, launch on Juneteenth 
even when that was confronted by COVID, we used arts as ways to kind of bring both the folks who were working on that project, community members together in public ciphers to kind of express how they were feeling and to, con and to sustain connectivity in, in really dynamic ways. Great. And you know, one of the things with the lack of trust is also it makes way for things that we see like misinformation and, and the conspiracy theories that we see on the internet. And um, so one of a question from, from an audience member, I think is important. Um, what can be done if an organization doesn't overtly support vaccination internally and in fact allows for anti-vax opinions as matter of um, as matter of much of science, going as far as HR sent out emails telling staff not to discuss vaccinations, um, all ideas that clearly come from a place of white privilege. Anybody want to take that one? I'm happy to, to take a stab first. First of all, Rami, I think you need to come through to Pittsburgh so we can have some of those uh, social uh, gatherings here. We're, we're lacking that a little bit. Um, I thought that's such an important question. I really appreciate it. I don't think there has been enough conversation around um, uh, how offices, how workspaces, et cetera, are prioritizing folks getting vaccinated um, and making sure that we all feel healthy and safe in our, when we get back to work and quote unquote return to normal. Um, I know there are conversations earlier today about vaccine passports, which I don't, um, not sure how far we'll be able to go with that, but I don't, I'm not sure what can be done personally. Obviously we should all continue to advocate as a researcher, as a physician, as a public health um, person, I think we must continue to advocate to, for our workspaces to be as safe as possible and that as many people as can that don't have uh, contraindications to getting vaccinated do get vaccinated. Obviously work policies in private sector are, are private and those decisions can be made, but I think we can continue to advocate for our own personal health as much as we can. Oh, uh, you know, it's an interesting, first of all, total shout out to both Pitt Pitt and, and to Pennsylvania and to and especially to Philly. But uh, in Pitt, you have uh, you know my one of our extraordinary artists, Jasiri X, and uh, um, and his extraordinary organization, One Hood, um, which does much of the same thing. And I think it's important to lift up artists like Jasiri uh, and and that type of work in urban centers, especially led by black and brown folks across the country. And so I wanna really make a, a strong pitch for that. We need to invest in artists as, as frontline health workers in that very real way, because in many ways they are often that critical fabric of keeping uh, the body, the social body politic, if you will, together. But I would say as an organization that has over, I have over 75 full-time employees, most of them, black and brown folks, uh, a vast majority of them, including at my top leadership level, um, many of whom were all over the spectrum when it came to the vaccine. Uh, we got early vaccines back in February through a, um, a major hospital, and then we started distributing them ourselves. And I remember at one point, we were probably up to like almost our 400th vaccine, and I was about to jump on an airplane. Um, and um, I was going in to get a test, and one of the nurses uh, who's extraordinary provider, uh, who's been actually disseminating the vaccine and we created this whole conversation. Um, she was giving me the test and I asked her, I said, sister, I said, did you, did you get it? She said, mommy, I still not feeling it. I'm still not feeling it. And I said, I need to understand where your head's at. And we had this great conversation and it was a reminder, she said, you know, I'm just really suspicious. I want to be honest, as a black woman, why they're so excited about putting a bunch of needles into our arms right now. And this is a nurse who is administering vaccines in our health center. And I think where we got in a very quick 20 minute conversation, which is, she said, now, if, if, if folks, if my people knew we genuinely cared about them and we're providing fresh food and we're providing jobs and we're fighting for this. If that same person came and talked about the vaccine, it'd be very different. And I, and I said, sister, isn't that what we're trying to do right here? And she said, yeah, I, I, you're right, you're right, you're right. I, but I still, you know, so we, we, we had this conversation and it was an indication to me 
that even when you're in the thick of doing it, Christina, even when you're just, you know, that I think Dr. Essien talked about the time that his father needs, right? Uh, I just got back from Buffalo, New York, one of the leading uh, FQHCs there that just started disseminating the uh, Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. And it's an extraordinary provider there, Dr. Ansari. And I was there on the day that Dr. Ansari had her father, her husband, her brother, but it was four months of conversations. And she knew she was going to wait for that one vaccine because that that mental obstacle of having to come back for a second shot. So she knew him. She was telling me two months ago, Rami, it's not going to work with my folks. I got to do the one vaccine when it's ready. And she had these three months of conversation. So time, engagement, very real com space for very real conversation on staff to really talk about, are we living up, even when an organization like Iman is professing to do all the things that the nurse was you know, I won't mention her name, that the sister was challenging us, uh, we have to confront sometimes the reality of perception between our professed ideals and our lived realities. And people on the ground will keep us honest about the gap between, you know, all the things that we say we want to do, right, in very, you know, flowery language and policy speeches and what uh, it feels like on the ground. Uh, because occasionally someone may pull you aside and say, Rami, that all sounded great, but it still feels like you're just putting a bunch of uh, needles in black and brown folks' arms and then saying, have a nice day. And we have to hear that sometimes and say, well, how do we, how do we live up to those values? And I think that's part of the conversation I encourage people to honestly have with their staffs and allow for that kind of voice to be heard. This is a, we only have five minutes, so this is maybe a, a big question for five minutes, but we're going to try. Um, what could reparations in a health or healthcare context look like? Yeah, so we shouted out that 2014 paper in the Atlantic, um, the case for reparations. I think hopefully the Atlantic publishes something similarly bold about the case for reparations in medicine. Um, but one of my colleagues, Dr. Michelle Morse, um, Dr. Mary Bassett, a few uh, leaders, uh, physician leaders out of New York have recently published a piece. And if I can find it um, while I get to hear Rami's beautiful comments, I'll, I'll post it in the in the chat, but they've really talked about clearly, again, drawing that through line from slavery to the disparities that we're seeing, um, especially amongst Black Americans as it relates to health. Life expectancy nearly three to five years shorter um, and widening as we've seen over the pandemic. So the reparations looks like literally getting rid of racist policies in, in our healthcare system. Who has access to, to health insurance in our country? Why is it still so deeply connected to employment when we know that racism exists and just literally my ethnic name showing up in somebody's inbox as trying to get a job? Um, how challenging it is for um, someone like myself to get a job compared to uh, my white counterpart or colleague. Um, what does, again, uh, just physical access to healthcare look like? We no longer have colored um, versus whites only uh, waiting rooms in our hospitals, but still we know that academic health centers are largely based in urban areas and still we can barely get to have appointments that are available in non-working hours at, or in sites that don't have $40 to park at these hospital sites when I'm showing up for uh, a regular primary care clinic visit. Um, you know, so these structural policies that, may, policies that may seem colorblind, but actually are baked into the policies and racist policy that have existed forever. Um, and even here with the vaccine, we're saying we're, we're using age, we've been using age-based cutoffs. We're finally starting to loosen some of those, but all throughout the past, the start of the pandemic, we've been using these age-based cutoffs to be able to get a vaccine, um, leaning into the colorblindness of this policy and clearly realizing that that shortened life expectancy that I mentioned in particular for black, um, Latinx, native and indigenous individuals, uh, it, 
did not allow them to qualify when we set the cutoff at 75 years of age, when we set the cutoff for only those who are healthcare workers. And we know that 11%, for the example, of all physicians are coming um, from black and brown communities. Um, and when we continue to drop that cutoff again, we continue to be missing several millions of um, uh, underrepresented and underserved individuals because of this quote unquote colorblind policy. We have to completely move away from that, stop trying to hide behind uh, a new generation where we, we just don't talk about race, we don't see color, and realize that for centuries, like Ram, you mentioned, that access to health care depended on the color of your skin, that access to be able to train as a physician depended on the color of your skin, and that we already did have very white-based policies in our country to be able to get health. And if we ever do want to reverse that, we have to continue to start to step away from these colorblind strategies that we've been using. I, I, I'd love to read, I'd love to see that study, read that study, and thank you for that. I, I would only add, just to, just to underscore that, I think it's, it looks, first of all, on the conversation of reparations, I think that's a very serious conversation. I, I am a proponent to have that very serious conversation, especially when it comes to just individual reparations and what that looks like in our, in our, across this country. And the pandemic has demonstrated once again, especially to black Americans, that that is possible to think about what mass uh, relief on an individual basis in a check amount actually looks like. Uh, and so you're gonna continue to hear that argument in a very real way. And I think for folks who, you know, uh, that do not like myself, who are not, uh, who benefit from black uh, American struggles have to start thinking about how we relate to that argument. But I would say in the medical field, just to underscore Dr. Essien's point, I think it looks, in, you know, there's two sides of that spectrum. It's what Dr. Essien mentioned, and I think that's directly related. When more of that history is recovered uh, and it begins to translate into representation of black folks in the medical field at all sides of the spectrum, it makes a big difference. Starting with Onesimus and, you know, an enslaved person on, you know, a plantation in Northeast England that uh, in Northeast, uh, in the Northeast on Cotton Mather's plantation, who was, you know, there during a moment where that, that part of the country was being ravaged by a smallpox uh, epidemic. And there was a group of enslaved West Africans who were not being affected. And when Onesimus was identified to ask why are, do you have this thing or not? And responded with a yes and no. And, and they demanded to understand why these brothers are not be, be following the same fate as so many others, responded by saying in West Africa, when one of us were sick with this, we had a tradition to prick, to take a thorn and to prick it into the bloodstream of the sick person and to insert that into those of us to protect us from the sickness. Of course, that goes on to be patented by Cotton Mather, and we have the early scientific kind of uh, genealogy of the modern day, you know, vaccine. But that's not talked about unless you're reading Ibrahim Kendi's stamp from the beginning, or you know, how do we get that knowledge back into public text? How do we not, you know, rather than just having to watch a movie like something the Lord made? How do we learn about Vivian Thomas? How do we learn about the extraordinary advances? that you know, uh, black American folks have made in the field of medicine and then allow that to translate in privileging and aggressively going after more representation across the spectrum. On the flips and the other side of that spectrum is going back, Christina, to everything we talked about in the early part of this conversation, which is how do we begin to be very precise about assigning a dollar amount to the 30, 40, 50 years of mass disinvestment in urban centers compounded by hypersegregation, by mass incarceration, and begin to invest philanthropically with private dollars into building up a long-term commitment that I think Dan spoke about in the beginning to start creating a type of you know, semblance of bending that moral arc that King talked about and to continue to try to fight for a semblance of equity so that the next time we're hit, that we won't have to be as you know, unsurprised by the profound disparities 
that we continue to see across the country today. So I think I speak for everyone that we could probably go on for another hour, but we're at our time limit. So thank you, thank you, thank you both so much. This has been a profoundly interesting, I learned so much myself. Um, I'm going to click all the links that are in the chat later. So thank you, thank you for being here and for all the knowledge um, and wisdom you shared with us today. Thank you.